Three minutes after ten is the time. A very good morning to you. James, please, 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 right, Stan, make it make sense. I watched all night and I really don't understand what happened. Gemma in Newcastle upon Tyne, right? So I have absolutely no idea, James. I'm waiting for you to explain it to me. Andy in Lincoln is being a little less generous. He says, please stop acting thick, James. You know exactly what happened. Uh, Natalie says, James, I need you to explain it, please. Uh, and Ryrie, I'm, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here because I'm reading texts live on the radio. I haven't actually read them before I came on air. <clears throat> so I can start reading them and they might go a little bit weird halfway through. James, please don't put me in idiot's corner. Uh, maybe naivety corner, but why is it that last night was such an important issue for the SNP stro stroke Tories? Why not stay and debate everything? I can't quite get my head around why they would be so outraged and leave the chamber rather than debate e each of the aspects properly. Um, and uh, a, a fond remembrance there of our, of our mutual friend Theo Usherwood, who did indeed have a peculiar gift for explaining these madnesses without upsetting anybody. Um, I think I know what happened. But I'm going to come at it, if I may, from a slightly different angle to begin with. Uh, yesterday morning, Keir Starmer was facing the possibility of possibly the worst parliamentary moment of his premiership. You have seen the desperate efforts that right-wing, well, that the Conservative Party and their chief leaders in the media have put into attempts to portray him as somehow stumbling at the moment. Um, the poll lead remains well. Uh, pretty much every poll has him 20 points or more ahead. Uh, the desperation to pretend that the uh, change on the spending pledges reg regarding net zero brought about... Well, rendered inevitable by Liz Truss immolating the British economy to the tune of some £30 billion pounds is, is somehow a sign of weakness. There are people who fear that he bends over too far to remove weapons from the hands of his foes, but the effectiveness of removing weapons from the hands of the foes remains impressive. Um, so yesterday morning he was facing possibly his worst moment in Parliament as leader of the Labour Party because many, many, many of his MPs, up to and including senior ministers, are very keen, uh, perhaps even desperate, to vote for a ceasefire in the Middle East, to join Prince William and countless others in calling for the killing to stop. Um, the killing now, with the uh, grim and disgusting spectacle of October the 7th in our rearview mirror, the killing now almost exclusively of Palestinians. And the massive majority of them are civilians and, of course, children. And as things stood because of parliamentary rubric, it would have been impossible for the Labour MPs keen to vote for a ceasefire to do so without voting for an SNP motion, which went a little bit further in the context of, or, or rather didn't go as far in the context of conditions as in meaningful legislation. Here is what would have to happen in order for us to call for a ceasefire as Keir Starmer wanted it to. So I think that the issue perhaps of collective punishment became crucial, the accusation of collective punishment. This is where you perhaps are paying even more attention than I was. And that created a scenario in which Keir Starmer faced a massive, massive rebellion. Um, I, I would imagine close to triple figures. I, I am told that two senior ministers were poised to resign their front bench positions if they were not free to vote for the SNP um, motion, which was measurably different from the uh, uh, Labour Party current position, but not different enough to dissuade Labour MPs and Labour ministers from wanting to vote for it. So yesterday morning, this time yesterday, Keir Starmer was staring down the barrel of a gun. By yesterday evening, the SNP leader in Westminster, Stephen Flynn, had led his members out of the chamber while complaining that everybody else was treating it like a pantomime. Nothing says stop treating things like a pantomime than marching off stage, presumably shouting, oh, no, we won't. 
The Conservatives were <clears throat> in complete disarray to the point where they didn't vote at all for the ceasefire that a significant number of their MPs actually want. Well, the Labour Party passed happily through the lobby to vote in favour of the motion that they had brought, or the amendment that they had brought to the SNP motion. So what was everybody actually cross about? Well, I'm going to say you tell me, 0345 6060 I'm going to say you tell me, because what they were cross about specifically was the decision by Lindsay Hoyle to allow votes on both the Conservative Amendment and the Labour Amendment. The Conservative Amendment was brought in in the hope of scuppering the Labour Amendment because the tradition is that the government's amendment would have priority over the opposition party's amendment on the SNP's day for being in charge. So they had their noses put squarely out of joint, up to and including the point where they seem to prioritise, I don't want to say political point scoring, but they did seem to prioritise partisan interest over the actual bloody ceasefire. You, all of this is up for grabs, by the way. All of this is open to criticism. All of this is absolutely um, primed for you to dismantle. Because if I'm completely honest, I'm not as clear as I should be on exactly what happened. I'm not a massive fan of Lindsay Hoyle. I don't really like saying that because the Speaker is a, a, an independent position. And when John Burko became a sort of target for all the Brexit liars, it, it, was, it was a horrible thing to witness. And, of course, it, it subsequently emerged that John Burko's record was uh, rather uh, badly scarred in the context of how he treated some colleagues. But I don't like it. I don't, you know, you, you, it's a bit like attacking the referee isn't it? It's the ultimate footballification. You don't like the way the result has gone, you're going to attack the referee. But the more you attack the referee, the more you actually threaten and compromise the rules, the only rules by which we can actually play. There are little instances of hilarity, if you like. Conservatives who cheered Boris Johnson to the rafters as he lied and lied and lied again in the House of Commons, rode roughshod over parliamentary standards, ignored his own advisor on ministerial ethics, failed to appoint one after two had resigned and uh, routinely denigrated the most arcane and important of traditions up to and including the code for parliamentary standards when his mate Owen Patterson um, rode all over it Boris Johnson and his pals tried to rip up the actual code so to see Tories suddenly discovering a deep reverence the Tories who of course cheered when, Bor when Jacob Rees-Mogg went to Balmoral to lie to the Queen about the unlawful prorogation of Parliament so you've got people now claiming in fact some of them have signed this this motion, this early day motion that Nick was talking about towards the end of his programme with Natasha. People who are signing this early day motion who were cool with the unlawful prorogation of Parliament itself. People who were in favour of the unlawful prorogation of Parliament itself have suddenly discovered a deep and abiding reverence for parliamentary rules. Oh no, that's absolutely awful. He he's given an early day. He's given he's given priority to the opposition party when tradition dictates that it should be the government party. Oh, but I'm absolutely fine with Jacob Rees-Mogg lying to the Queen about the unlawful prorogation of Parliament. The scale of hypocrisy on display today is actually nuclear, absolutely nuclear. But here we are. I don't even blame some of the MPs that have signed this motion. Because their brains are so boiled by Brexit and Boris Johnson, they've forgotten which way is up and which way is down. What is it? What are we signing? We're very cross about something the Speaker did. But why weren't we cross about that time that Boris Johnson lied to the House of Commons? Why weren't we cross about that time that they unlawfully... But it doesn't matter. Don't ask silly questions. Just sign the bloody motion. If enough people sign it, Lindsay Hall will have to resign. And the point at which I think these Tory MPs and some of the SNP MPs should perhaps pause is this point. Um, what's the win here? If Lindsay Hoyle resigns because the number of MPs queuing up to claim they have no confidence in him exceeds an as yet unspecified number, who actually wins? And what the hell does it do for the people on the Gaza Strip who could perhaps have drawn some sucker and comfort from the thought that the British political establishment last night finally found the cojones to pass a call for a ceasefire, albeit that the people who have led the line on calling for a ceasefire, the SNP, didn't vote for it. They, I'm afraid, as far as I can tell, tried to take their ball home, by which point 
Lindsay Hoyle had punctured their ball and instead inflated a new one and given it to the Labour Party while the Conservative Party were whining that it should be their ball first and Labour shouldn't have a ball in the game at all. So if you were expecting me to explain it to you, and clearly from the texts I read at the beginning of the programme, lots of people were, um, I fear I've let you down. Let me have a look at some more texts, shall I? What about Starmer threatening Hoyle? No mention of that. Um, well, I've just mentioned it. It's been denied by everybody involved, but you, you, you keep clinging to that if you want. As I understand it, Starmer intervened with Hoyle and pointed out that some of his MPs who rebelled last time, if they had to follow the whip this time, would be facing threats and violence. Whether or not the Speaker should ever take that into account when taking a decision such as the one he took, I genuinely don't know. But... Um, uh, I, I, I'm afraid that line about the threats, despite coming from one of the most august political journalists in the country, who I've had the great pleasure of working with, did seem to deflate uh, a little as the day went on. So here's what I can't see anybody arguing with. Yesterday, and I think this is why everyone's so furious, from backbench MPs whose t scarves are tied so tightly round their neck, none tighter, of course, than the chair of the 1922 committee, it's literally his job to support the Conservative Parliamentary Party, whatever they do, however awful they are. Um, and it, it rarely does, does, does footballification seem so clear to me. So what no one can argue with is this. Yesterday morning, Keir Starmer was facing possibly his worst day in Parliament as Labour leader. By yesterday evening, the Conservative Party was having a fit of the vapours and the SNP had taken their ball home while Labour actually passed a ceasefire motion in the House of Commons for the first time since this bloody nightmare in the Middle East began. That's why the Tories are so furious, because Labour somehow pulled victory out of the, out of the fire. Uh, the SNP are furious because they wanted to be seen as the leaders of on this occasion, or they're furious because of the um, trumping by Lindsay Hoyle of parliamentary tradition and procedure, something for which he was ticked off by his own clerk. And the Labour Party, if you like, are, what's the word we want here? Embarrassed, despite their victory, because partly because of them, but largely because of the Conservatives and the SNP, a debate that should be historic with regard to calling for a ceasefire in Gaza instead looks like being historic because of the pathetic behaviour of many, many MPs. So there is my analysis. Please tear it to shreds. 0345 is the number you need. If we want to make it a little less personal, as in tearing my analysis to shreds, i tell you what I'd like to do. And in a way, I need a couple of phone lines for this. So we might have to put some people who've already rung in on, on pause. In a way, I'd really like you, and I'm going to insist, I know I've just taken about half an hour to do it, so this is incredibly hypocritical and unfair of me, but hey-ho, it's my show. Oh, I've got a new catchphrase. Um, <laughs> hey-ho, it's my show. Uh, you explain what you think happened. In, what, five sentences? What do you think is a reasonable number of sentences in which to do it? So, invitation number one, here's my analysis. Please tear it to shreds, 0345 6060973. Uh, and invitation number two, you tell me what happened. Ignore what I've just said. You tell me what you think happened yesterday in the House of Commons. You've got five sentences in which to do it. A couple of texts. Uh, the biggest disappointment for me was Stephen Flynn. He's been a real voice recently. For me, yesterday, he was childlike. I Don't shoot the messenger, I'm just... Reading it out, Labour have effectively failed to support a ceasefire, says Brian, because of the conditions which allow the Israelis off the hook. Loosen the scarf around your neck, James, says Brian. May well be a valid criticism. Uh, and the MPs didn't go through the division on the Gaza ceasefire vote. It was decided on a nod. Perhaps it would be a better debate if James got some facts right. That seems to be a perfectly reasonable criticism as well. But I, I like to conjure up the imagery of parliamentary procedure. The point is, of course, that the... Um, Amendment passed.